Okay, good afternoon. Um, there's about 60 people online, so I think we better make a start to reward those people that arrived on time. Um, welcome to the LEAD seminar this afternoon. Um, it's a bit of a different uh, format from what we've had before. Um, so I'm just going to go through what we're going to do. So Jacinta Douglas and I, I'm Chris Bigby, the Director of the Living with Disability Research Centre and Emeritus Professor Jacinta Douglas. Um, we've been undertaking a research programme for a number of years around supported decision making. And so to, this afternoon is a chance to present some of the evaluative work um, that is the sort of last but one piece uh, of our research program. Um, and so what we're presenting to you is some work in progress. Um, it might change and develop as we refine some of the analysis, but we wanted to share some of this, some of the preliminary findings this afternoon. So um, please uh, listen and you can have the slides uh, if they'll be available after the seminar. Um, but at the moment, there is no published paper, although we're papers. We're working very hard on, on drafting those at the moment. So there should be some that will be certainly submitted for publication by the end of this year. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start and give a fairly brief introduction uh, to the purpose of our program of research and to uh, the Latrobe Support for Decision Making Practice Framework. And then Jacinta is going to talk about the findings from the an evaluation of implementing that framework um, in the traffic, the Victorian TAC, the Traffic Accident Commission. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some preliminary findings of training parent supporters of people with intellectual disabilities in the framework and their experiences of using it. So um, if you want to ask questions, you can use the Q&A box. We will stop for questions at the end of Jacinta's, uh, Jacinta's presentation um, and try and have a discussion and then have a very quick break and then come back again. So there'll be lots of opportunity to ask questions. Okay, so the overarching purpose of our program of research has been very much in the context of a paradigm shift about decision making and people with cognitive disabilities. There's been a very clear shift, as many people will be aware, um, heralded maybe very strongly by the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Pe Persons with Disabilities, about the right of people with cognitive disabilities to participate in decision making and their right to have the support that they need to participate. Um, and the sense that um, what we've tried to do is to contribute to uh, the broader endeavour of people with cognitive disabilities receiving good decision making support. It's all very well to say people have the right to good support and the right to participate in decisions, but the quality of the support is what makes the realisation of those rights possible. So what our purpose has been to try and build the capacity of supporters to provide effective decision support, to develop a demonstratively effective capacity building tool for decision making supporters and to try and fill the void uh, that existed when we started and still exists today uh, in terms of evidence based effective and flexible resources, training and support for decision making supporters of people with cognitive disabilities. And clearly what we've been trying to address is also a major policy challenge that's confronting the disability sector and in particular the NDIS in terms of putting into practice uh, the aims that it has of people with all disabilities exercising more choice and control about their lives and the types of services that they use. And clearly support for decision making is fundamental to that happening for people with intellectual disabilities and people with acquired brain injury. So our aim has been to develop and trial evidence-based support for decision-making practice framework. So it's an evidence-based support for decision-making practice framework, which I'm going to call the framework from now on because that's a mouthful. Um, and the aim of our framework has been to increase the capacity of supporters to enable people with cognitive disabilities to participate in decision-making and for supporters to provide more effective support 
for decision making. So our overarching uh, research questions have been, how do we understand uh, the relevance of the framework uh, to decision supporters? How do they understand it? Is it relevant to them? And to try and explore what their experience has been of using the framework. And then what's the impact of the training in the framework? Uh, has it increased the capacity of supporters to enable the person to participate in decision making? And does it enable supporters to use more effective processes um, that are associated with providing effective support? So, and I'm gonna do this very quickly because uh, many of you would have heard uh, myself or Jacinta talk about the development of the framework in previous seminars. And this work has now um, been published and the framework has been available and it's actually been downloaded about 10,000 times um, in, from the Journal of Disability and Rehabilitation. So basically we used the four phrase approach, which was modeled on the Medical Research Council guidance for developing and evaluating complex interventions. First step was clearly about reviewing the existing evidence about processes of support for decision making and exploring uh, the experiences of people being supported and the experiences of supporters. Then we developed the framework based on that evidence, um, developed the training that went with it and tested that, uh, piloted it and refined it. And now we're at the third stage, which is about the stage of evaluation, which is about assessing the effectiveness of the framework and understanding the change processes that happen for people when they're trained in the framework. And we're also now ha quite happily sliding in to the fourth stage, which is about implementation and dissemination and being able to, to take a longer view about long-term follow-up of organizations that are using the framework. So what we found from much of the preliminary work in, in the first stage of development was what are the features of, of decision support, which are really important in terms of understanding how you might develop a framework to help people understand how to provide effective support. It was very clear that providing support is a complex process that's got interacting and overlapping components, and it's, in, it's iterative rather than happening in a straight line. The type of support is shaped very much by the context in which it happens and by the actual decision that, that you're providing support around. So the type of support that people need changes with every decision. It changes with the context of decisions and the context in which the person finds himself in. Decision support involves multiple players, clearly the person with cognitive disability, their supporters, uh, which may be quite a number of supporters and other people who may influence the decision, who may have views about it, or who may be impacted or involved in the, in the consequences of the decision that's made. And each part of the process needs to be tailored to the individual person that you're providing support for. And what's also uh, clear from our findings is that implementing the decision uh, can often be quite problematic and it may not rest necessarily with decision supporters. So the support for decision-making is often, uh, m the last phase of it is actually finding uh, maybe advocates to support the implementation. So decision supporters aren't necessarily always responsible for implementing decisions. And that highlights the issue that decision support is not the same thing as advocacy. Advocates often start from the position where a decision has been made and are interested to make sure that decision gets implemented. They're not necessarily supporting people to make the decision in the first place. Although this, it's a fuzzy world between uh, decision support and advocacy, and that's something that needs to be unpacked a little further. So this is the framework. Um, as you can see, it's in the shape of a wheel, and that's the way in which uh, a number of our participants have begun to talk about it as the wheel. Um, but what it is, is it sets out the seven steps that are involved in making a decision and providing decision support. They're not linear. You don't go step one, step two, step three, and so on. You may go backwards and forwards between these steps, and you may not necessarily do them in this order, but in order to reach a decision and to get it implemented, 
you need to go through all of these steps. Um, and it's informed by the three principles at the center. So everything that decision supporters do is informed by these three principles. The first one is a commitment to the rights of the person to participate in decision-making and to respect and to put at the center of decision support, the person's own preferences and their long-term will. The second principle is about orchestration which is about involving other key people and other people that know the person from different perspectives. And then the third principle is around reflection and review. So the supporter reflecting on, um, on what their practice actually is, what their values are, um, and seeing how those are influencing their actions, and then reviewing the nature of their support uh, against these principles and in terms of the model as a whole. And then around the outside are strategies and we, and, and clearly uh, strategies depend on the decision and on the person. And we identified many, many, many different types of strategies. Um, and you need to draw on the strategies that are appropriate uh, for the particular decision and the person that you're supporting. There are things like being able to uh, scaffold concepts and break them down into, into smaller pieces to help somebody understand them. The things about uh, making sure the person's understanding communication and the ideas that you're trying to get across and and often about actually uh, exploring options through experience, expanding the options that the person's aware of so that they're in a better position to be able to make uh, to, to express their preferences. If you haven't experienced something, it's very hard uh, to decide what your preferences are um, if you can't think in an abstract way. So I'm not gonna go through the framework in any more detail, um, but there it is. And that's what we've been then uh, teaching people how to use it. So from developing the framework, we developed um, a set of training materials and uh, a one day interactive workshop, um, which explored the framework and how it might apply to the people who were participating in the training and helped people to share their experiences and their reflections on, on the way they provided support and how they thought this framework might apply to their situation. And then as part of our, of our trial, um, we've done follow-up mentoring to people. So a one-day workshop really isn't enough. People need follow-up support to be able to apply the concepts to their particular situation and the person that they're supporting. So mentoring uses their current examples from their current practice. And there's a set of online resources that are freely available, which we developed to help uh, the training process um, and which were based on the evidence that we'd collected about processes of support. So there's lots of clips in the training uh, which illustrate some of the different issues that supporters have to grapple with, as well as each of the steps. And then at the, we're now at the evaluation stage and we've undertaken a series of separate studies which have used very similar methods. Um, as you know, we had an ARC uh, linkage grant that funded a large randomized control study of training. Um, we had 76 dyads, so pairs of a supporter and a decision maker with cognitive disability. We had 55 people with intellectual disability and 21 people with acquired brain injury. And those were all people who were able to participate in an interview. So there were people with mild to moderate intellectual disability and people with acquired brain injury who were able to participate um, in an interview. And then we had another smaller group, which was five people uh, who were supporters of somebody with a more severe or profound intellectual disability uh, who wasn't able to participate in, uh, in an interview. And then we've uh, done a smaller study, uh, which was funded by the Victorian Traffic Accident Commission, which uh, aimed to train 10 of their experienced uh, support coordinators in the model, and then to see the impact that it had on their practice. And we have some work in progress still, which is around um, implementing the model for the Queensland Public, Pub, Office of the Public Trustee. Um, they've adapted our training and they've been training all their frontline staff uh, in a version of the framework, 
which is focused on uh, supporting people with financial decision making, which is the role of that office. And then Leadership Plus, which is in Victoria's an advocacy group, which was part of the DSS trial of support for decision making around NDIS decisions. And we've trained uh, some of their staff in it and we have been doing follow up case studies of how they've applied the framework to the group of people that, that they've worked with. So what we're going to do today is to share the preliminary findings from the TAC study and a subgroup from the ARC study. So I'm going to stop talking there and uh, unshare my screen and hand it over to Jacinta, who's going to talk about the TAC study. It's a slow computer day or a slow internet day, so just bear with us for a minute while we do swap over. Okay, lovely to have you all here today. Such a we've up to ninety one people, um, so we're we're actually sharing our information and I think some some lovely results in many ways with a lot of you. So what I'm going to talk about, as Chris said, is our small trial that we undertook with the support of the Transport Accident Commission in Victoria that looked at building capability to support client decision making in um, staff members of their independence claims division. So let's quickly move to, there we go. So the background of this is that the Transport Accident Commission at the beginning of 2019 um, undertook to introduce their new service model framework. And in that whole conceptualization, they felt that there was a really strong underpinning need for something like a supported decision making or support for decision making framework. So they approached us to actually um, participate by delivering a trial, by delivering training. And the aim of that training was to translate our existing evidence of support for decision making to, to actually um, training a small cohort of independence claims employees to apply the approach to their client planning interactions and to deliver services in what the TAC labelled as a manner that was consistent with contemporary disability practice. There we go, sorry. Um, so the specific objectives of this trial was to design and deliver a quality training program to these independence claims employees that actually set out and worked through applying the framework to their practice. The independence claims employees work in the independence division of the Transport Accident Commission of the TAC. And the goal overall is to encourage clients to create their independence goals themselves and to manage their plan for attaining those goals. So you can see how there's a nice interface between um, making decisions oneself following one's preferences and long-term wills within that will within that perspective. We also actually set out to assess the training specific impact on the support coordinators to see what worked well and what didn't work well in the context of their practice and to identify critical facilitators and barriers and key learnings from implementing the training with this group of, of claims support coordinators. So we used a pre post mixed method design to actually both deliver and to evaluate this training. In the pre measure perspective, we used in the pre measure component, we used several measures, we used um, a measure called the Melbourne decision making style measure, which looks at a person's dis personal decision making style themselves to get a sense of how these claims coordinators approach to decision-making um, issue for themselves. We looked at a confidence rating about support for decision-making. We then um, also administered the decision support questionnaire, which we developed as a customised research measure to use in the ARC grant that looked at 
support strategies that were consistent with or not consistent with, for that matter, to a support for decision making framework or a supported decision making framework. And we also um, asked participants to identify a recent experience that they'd had with respect to supporting someone with decision making and to describe their responses. Today, I'm actually going to share with you the results of the decision making questionnaire, giving you an idea of how these people themselves set about making decisions, the confidence rating and the DSQ or the support questionnaire. We then undertook the training um, component of the program and that instead of being a full one day interactive um, training, face-to-face -face training component, we divided into two four hour face-to-face -face sessions. It fitted better within the workplace environment and it also allowed people to go away and think about what we had in the first session and come back and clarify some of that in the second session, as well as applying it more specifically to examples in their own practice. We actually evaluated the training with respect to feedback about the content of the training. And we followed up with one 45 minute phone mentoring session which each, with each of the coordinators. And we repeated those measures post the training. And we undertook not only looking at how confidence potentially had changed, whether or not the, the support strategies the person used had changed, had changed and we also did a thematic analysis of the transcripts of the mentoring um, sessions that we'd actually um, worked with. The, the pre-measure session was an online, we had created an online survey for people to fill it in at the best time available to them in their workplace and the post-measure was delivered in the same way um, except for the, the mentoring which was delivered by phone. Okay, so these are the quantitative measures, just quickly to give you an idea of how they work. The Melbourne um, decision making questionnaire that was developed by Mann and colleagues back in 1997 looks at personal decision coping patterns, as I said. It has four factors or four subscales vigilance, hypervigilance, buck passing, and procrastination. Buck passing and procrastination procrastination, I think, um, are pretty much self-explanatory. Hypervigilance um, reflects a coping style that almost becomes um, over-anxious about very small details rather than looking at the bigger picture. So it can be a, a quite a limiting style in the sense of actually getting something done in the decision-making space. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit more about vigilance in a moment because you'll see that that tended to be the pattern that was seen across these coordinators. You can see the number of items and you can also see um, the scoring. So it goes from zero, not true at all, to sometimes true, to true for me. So it's a self-report questionnaire. As is the confidence rating scale, which looks at confidence providing support for decision making. Um, it doesn't have any subscales. It's a straightforward zero to 10 point scale rating. And where zero is, is I have the worst possible confidence and 10 moves up to the best possible confidence around some providing support for decision making. The DSQ is the, dis the um, decision support questionnaire. And we're at the moment analysing a lot of the um, data that we have on the DSQ. It looks at strategy use consistent with supported decision making principles. Um, we've analysed the reliability of the measure, that is, does the content hang together in a reliable fashion? That means you can administer the questionnaire, that you actually get meaningful data around um, what you're, you're looking at with respect to the content measuring what appears to be an overall construct, but we certainly do have factors within it and we're in the process of identifying those factors. Um, there's 32 items. It, they're measured on a frequency scale across four points from never or rarely, which is one, to usually or always, which is four, which gives us relative sensitivity so that what we are hoping to be able to do and what it appears we can do in our first preliminary analysis is see that there is change occurring in how the supporter is delivering support 
to the person they're, they're actually supporting. And the, um, the experience questionnaire looks at responses to a recent situation. We're not going to look at the data with this one because what we have is a different decision being looked at across all of the participants. So that gives us really good information. And in fact, the information around the scenarios has been used within the TAC to develop cases that are very much specific to that context. So it's been very useful from the point of view of making sure that we, we can fashion a training and a resource um, for that particular context. But because the scenario changes and is because that scenario is, is self-selected by the person who fills this in, it means there's a lot of variability that's uncontrolled across that measure. Our participants, as Chris said, were 10 independence claims employees who were participating in this service management framework trial that the TAC was, was um, carrying out. There were nine of them were the support coordinators and they worked in different contexts across the organisation. So four of them worked in what is called the early context of the independence division. That means working with people who are newly injured, who tend to be still in hospital, who are actually going through that very early acute and relatively um, early subacute um, experience of, of a brain injury. Um, three were in the active stage, which is people who are actually out there in the community and um, living in the community, being active in their community and getting on with their own lives. Um, one person worked in the return to work environment and one um, was, was described as a specialist who actually worked often with um, particularly complex cases, or, although I have to say that almost all of the cases in the independence division um, could be described as, as complex. The 10th person was the team manager and that person um, we didn't include in the data analysis. The team manager very much wanted to participate and we wanted them to participate so that we could actually get that perspective when we looked at what works, what doesn't work, what can we change, what can we improve over time within the framework and within the training for this group of people. So if we look at their pre-training personal coping style, what you can see here is, is the graph of their score on each of those subscales within the decision-making questionnaire. And again, on the vertical axis is the scoring from zero, not true at all about me, to two, which goes up to true for me. So you can see that as a group, the group were particularly or scored particularly high on the vigilance subscale or factor and did not score highly at all on the remaining three factors, particularly procrastination, which wouldn't work very well in a relatively fast paced environment as the, the traffic accident commission is. They were not back passes, which is kind of good from the point of view of working as a team. And they were not particularly hypervigilant. So what does it mean that they actually had uh, a high score on the vigilance subscale? Well, when we look at the, the behaviours that are associated with someone who tends to, to be a vigilant decision maker in their own lives, they make sound and rational decisions, which is, is a positive thing for most of us. They have a tendency to clarify objectives they canvass alternatives relatively broadly. They search thoroughly for relevant information. They sim assimilate information in an unbiased manner and they evaluate alternatives carefully. Remembering that this particular scale was developed on a large group of people in the, in the healthy normative population. So we have an idea here that this particular group of coordinators in a sense, by their very own personal coping style, were particularly well suited to actually being able to apply the support for decision-making framework in their workplace. In fact, 
you know, it was interesting because I think what happened was within the organisation, people were asked to volunteer to participate in this trial. And then of those people who volunteered, people were identified or selected to participate. And I think what we kind of have is a little bit of a sampling bias or maybe a reflection on the people who work in this context. And that is that they tend to display a vigilant coping style in their own decision making. So let's now move on to the results of what we found out. And we're going to work through looking at the training evaluation from a content perspective, look to see whether or not the participants' confidence in their own ability to support people with decision-making changed. We're going to look at whether or not their strategy use changed as a result of the training. And we're also going to have a look at the thematic analysis of the mentoring transcripts. Um, and in doing that, look at the factors that perhaps created difficulties within the context that people were working in, and also look at the um, coding of those transcripts to see whether or not we could identify evidence of participants using the steps in our framework. So firstly, with respect to their response to training, if we look at what they de described as being beneficial aspects of the training, almost all of them or seven of the, of the nine people who participated in the evaluation directly um, stated that some of the, the best things was building their knowledge about supported decision making. They talked about um, understanding legislation and world standards and definition and, and and the definition and breakdown of what supported decision making is. So they were very positive about that and understanding that. They were very positive about understanding the Latrobe model of supported decision making or support for decision making, and also felt that they really appreciated from their own perspective how they could apply this and how they could apply the approach to supported decision making in their workplace. Um, they talked a lot about the fact that speaking about describing, considering specific client scenarios was really useful. Um, troubleshooting a suitable approach within a particular case for them or with, with a particular person was really useful, which we did within the training. So this application to real world scenarios was really important to them. Um, they felt it was really useful to discuss the videos. And within the videos we had created for um, both this trial and for the ARC trial, um, a set of videos that look at how the sorts of decision-making issues that might arise that fit in with our framework in the sense of, of illustrating the framework with people with brain injury um, as, they, as they go about their own lives. They talked about the videos being great, but as you'll see from the aspects to improve, they, they felt that they could have more, even more practical activities, more practical examples and reviewing how to manage more difficult situations. Um, and made a really good suggestion that perhaps participants could bring their own scenarios to work through. We certainly discussed scenarios from people's practice during the training sessions, but there was a great hunger or, or need for even more discussion of, of practical examples, particularly very, very difficult examples. Um, they sometimes felt that the unstructured discussion went on a little bit too long and we got off track. And I have to say that it's interesting that support for decision-making brings up many, many, many different issues and overlaps with a lot of areas of practice with respect to understanding um, the, the, the role of a substitute decision maker if they're involved in the situation. So we, we did cover a lot of different areas within those discussions. Um, however, they felt that these discussions were still useful, which is always good. Okay, so in a sense, there were aspects we could that, that we could certainly see could be improved, but overall, the majority of people felt that um, the the training was particularly beneficial. The number here I didn't point out to you was the number of people who made a specific response 
to this particular theme in their open-ended questions within the evaluation. The thing that I'm always interested in and we're always interested in is to see what people say about, so what is your takeaway message? What are you going to take away from this training to take back to your practice? And these are direct quotes from our participants around that. And there were takeaway messages identified across eight of the nine um, people who who completed this open-ended um, question. And they involved things like understanding what support for decision-making means for me in my role. And that move from understanding something just with respect to theoretically to also recognising how it can apply in your role is really important within a training um, context. They talked about things like making sure family are aware of alternative options other than substitute decision making. And again, that is really important within the move to, to really um, supporting a person to have the right and the capacity to make decisions for themselves or to participate in decision making. They talked about how it was really good to have it emphasised that getting to know the client was really important. And that is the first step in our framework that really, unless you get to know the person who you're supporting, it's really hard to deliver effective support for decision making. Um, you actually start, as they said, one of the participants said with, with consideration of a person's ideas and help them to make a plan to take steps towards it. And that probably seems like, a, you know, we should all know that from the point of view of, of supporting somebody to, to actually make decisions in their life. But the fact that that became really important for them and that's where they wanted to start when they went back to practice was important from my perspective. Um, that their goal was to help the client communicate their will and preferences. Really nice to see that so beautifully and simply said. To identify when a client may be able to participate in decision making much more than what they are doing. And there are certainly lots of examples that were brought up where a person was almost denied the opportunity to participate in decision making because of, of whether it be health professional providers or their own family members. Achieving support for decision making is difficult, so they recognised that it was damn hard, that there were many players in this game, and that even when it's difficult, aspects can still be applied, even in a situation where the person has a substitute decision maker um, who has been appointed. Um, everybody talked about this is really good to get to understand what will and preferences what preference is, and frequently even in our discussions, people said, you know, I didn't think about this necessarily as a basic human right, but of course it's a basic human right. And again, seeing that, that concept reinforced was really important. I was really happy to see that despite the fact that they, they started off with a sort of average confidence in their ability to provide support for decision making, we had a really significant change, even though we only had nine people participating in their sense of confidence after the training. So their confidence um, improved from being just over, you know, five to being at, at a level of eight. And that's a, that, as I said, it's statistically significant, but it was certainly significant and came out a great deal with respect to the, the coordinator's perspective when we were doing the mentoring sessions. If we look at the, the decision making, the, the, the decision support um, questionnaire and the strategies that were used, what we see here is that there are five, there are seven items, I should say, that were statistically significant from pre to post evaluation. And you never know what five items that's going to be. But the positive thing from our perspective when we reviewed this was really that those changes um, reflected very much changes that were consistent with the framework. So there was reduced alliance on best interest rather than will and preference. There was a move towards practice that supports the client's right to participate in decision-making, um, that checking the client wanted to be supported to make the decision had occurred. And it was an item that was really interesting because 
almost all of the participants noted that they never did check to see often whether this person required their support or wanted their support. And that had increased quite remarkably from a frequency perspective. That they were considering the significance of the decision and the consequences of the outcome with the client not for the client, so that it was very much sitting with the person and understanding significance and consequence from the client's perspective. That they, they had the frequency of choosing for the person had reduced quite remarkably or significantly, and that they were working through each of the steps involved in the decision with the person. And again, the frequency of doing that increased um, significantly from pre to post training. And one of the issues that we were particularly pleased about was that, if you like, principle of reflection, because these coordinators reported a significant increase in, in how often they, can sit, they were considering their own potential influence. So they were reflecting on their practice. They were reviewing their practice um, with respect to supporting the person. Um, and they were doing that a lot more after the training than they were before the training. Okay, so now we're going to move on to looking at the thematic analysis. There's two types of, the, of analysis that we performed on the mentoring, uh, on the transcripts from the mentoring sessions. This one really looks at identifying facilitators, barriers and key learnings that the TAC were really keen to learn about with respect to rolling out the support for decision making framework across all of their coordinators and all of their the people who work with people um, within the the TAC. So what we're going to do here is look at these factors or look at these um, particular issues that arose and a quote that goes with it. What was interesting is that the workplace demands and supports that are provided to a person who is acting as a supporter for decision making in a professional environment are really important. And many of them talked about the fact, fact that they were doing a lot because they, there were lots of different issues being introduced in their um, service management framework trial. So they commented on they were probably learning too many new things in one go, but we're all getting there. And I think considering what's happening in the workplace, how many things are changing is certainly worth um, being aware of. Not necessarily that you can change it, but that you're aware of it and you apply support mechanisms for the professionals that you're working with. Um, in fact, they very much appreciated the mentoring sessions. They also talked about the fact that the severity of, of the impairment of that the person was that the person they were working with had and the stage of recovery was really important. And it was a bit of a crossover between both workplace and the, the needs of the client in the sense that particularly purple, people who were working in the early space felt they were particularly under the pump and were particularly pressured because of, of working with really, really challenging situations for people. They talked about how understanding or being able to get a good picture of cultural and socio-demographic factors was really important to them. And the example here really brings up the, 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 the interaction between the severity of the impairment the person is actually dealing with, as well as getting an understanding of their background. So this is a quote where the coordinator says, he's just come out of post-traumatic amnesia, PTA, but he was in it for 131 days, which means he was unable to remember from one moment to the next for 131 days. So a very, very severe brain injury. So he's severely impaired, he's nonverbal. Where does he go? Because I don't really know where he grew up. We've got no family anywhere. And she was just describing a client who, they had no close connections that they could talk to about this person. They hadn't been able to identify family. He'd been in a car accident. He'd been found alone, not near an area that he actually lived in, etc. So all of those things became really difficult because there was no sense of what the person's background was at this point, particularly for that 131 days of post-traumatic amnesia. They also talked about the challenges of comorbidities 
that in fact working in this environment you're frequently working with people who not only have a brain injury but may have other comorbidities and this is an example of this here but he was smoking ice we were trying to fix him but he was smoking ice he was erratic he was crazy um difficult to actually work with and and that sort of complexity um made life very difficult with respect to providing effective support for decision making in that context. Um, they talked about the presence and the quality of the client's support network that was around the person. And a lot of the time there was a was a recognition that there is just somebody else controlling everything he does in his life. And that sense that the person was was not being given by his support network the opportunity to participate in decision making. So even though it may be happening within the professional context, it was very hard to get that carryover into the client's everyday living context. Um, and frequently within that there was conflict. So it was not only just being controlled, but being controlled in different directions by different supporters within the client's support network. Um, there was also some discussion about the sort of support the provider groups were, were giving to, to clients in the context and how that could be really difficult. So this comment was, I feel like he has got, a, he has got provider groups around him who kind of undermine his, undermine his capacity to participate in decision making. And that issue of, of being very wary of risk and making sure from a professional perspective, often providers were very anxious about um, the risk that the person might be taking if they were being given the opportunity to make a decision and follow through on it um, according to their own personal preference. And finally, potential community options. Um, what, what was really interesting, and I, this is a, a quote that um, kind of gets you through when you're trying to roll out a new way of thinking or a new framework, and this participant said, but, you know, it's now getting to the point when I look at your checklist and that's our support for decision-making checklist and things. We're now involving some more supports and we're actually having a meeting in a couple of weeks with him to start to look at the options and the different impacts of each option and to help him to make a decision. So there was, there was a reinforcement that in fact, yes, we can do this and we can move to a point where we can apply this within the community context. Okay, nearly to the end of this, this component of our presentation this afternoon. I think this is pretty much our last slide. The other um, way we looked at the transcripts from the mentoring sessions were to identify evidence of the support for decision making steps or the steps that we had outlined in our checklist that people took back to their work practice as a way of guiding or reminding them. And to give you a sense of how to, to look at this slide, the dark green means that all or almost all of the coordinators described doing this within their everyday practice by the time they were doing their mentoring sessions, which were you know, quite, a, quite a period of time after the, the training session. So the, the dark green ones were things like they were finding ways to know the person, to get to know the person. They made sure they identified what the decision, what important decision, what the important decision was for the person. They talked about exploring their preferences, the person's preferences. They identified where their conflict existed so they, that they could step into that conflict space knowingly and potentially support through that process. They also... Um, talked about commitment and, and some of the quotes there were really revealing about their sense of commitment to making sure the person had the ability to, to express preferences, but also to participate in decision making. They talked about also um, the fact that they were reviewing and reflecting on their own practice and their own practice was changing. So that was really heartening from, from our perspective to see those particular, if you like, um, aspects of our framework being talked about in mentoring and talked about as if they had been absolutely um, added to and incorporated within professional practice. So that was pretty much eight or nine 
out of the eight out of nine or nine of the of the coordinators. When you look at the next level of green, um, it was still a high use, and that was usually around seven, six to seven. Sometimes it varied on some of these, but definitely well over half of the group. And they described features of the decision that they could do. They could think back to that. They they actually um, identified constraints, as I said, that I think I gave you the wrong colour for that when I was looking at it. They refined the decision with constraints considered. They actually identified whether a formal process was needed. And you can see these, they identified associated decisions, which was really, really positive to see in the process. And they um, paid attention to how they communicated with the person. They listened and engaged the person in the process. The next level was medium. And you can see with the medium um, uptake, to uptake, if you like, of the practices, there was little opportunity often within the process of the mentoring and, and the trial to see whether or not a final decision had been reached for people. One of the things that was really clear is, you know, decision making can be a prolonged process um, that, in fact, there was often difficulty in identifying advocates who could maybe help with the implementation of the, pro of the decision, um, that creating opportunities was also a real challenge frequently. And orchestration was a challenge, that is finding people to include in the um, environment with the person. And the very low, um, if you like, change in behaviour that, that they were able to either initiate or to follow through with was checking whether or not the person's preferences were maintained during implementation. That was partially because very little opportunity um, across the trial was there from that perspective. So final slide. What did we learn from the perspective of this um, trial, this you know, albeit small trial within the Transport Accident Commission, we found that these particular support coordinators were incredibly well suited to implementing support for decision making, that training had a very positive impact on confidence and on skill with respect to strategy use. Um, remembering that the um, service management framework was directed at creating independence in clients to develop their own goals and manage their plan for retaining them. So this particular, our support for decision-making uh, framework was particularly well suited to that goal. It's a similar goal to choice and control that we see in the NDIS. And what's needed? Um, tailoring of training to specific contexts is needed. Um, more specific case scenarios, our online resource. Now we've done all of that as a result of, of our training and and the TAC has now rolled out a framework that we've tailored to their needs within the internal community of the TAC. And the idea of having an internal community of practice within an organisation um, is being acted upon so that they will have people who can, who can actually work with each other and support people to introduce um, these principles within their everyday practice. Um, what, what we really need, and I think this is clear, is that there needs to be increased support for decision-making opportunities for people around the person, their families, their health professionals and their support workers. And finally, um, we do have opportunities to compare these results with our ARC linkage findings. That's it for me. Okay, I'm going to make a start. Um, so that we've got time for questions at the end. So what I'm going to talk about is a part of a, a subset of the data from our larger ARC study of the support for decision making framework. And I'm going to talk about a group of parent supporters who were supporting people with intellectual disabilities. So this is quite a contrast then to the group that Jacinta worked with at the TAC who were experienced professionals who were supporting people in a particular service context um, and people with acquired brain injury. What I'm talking about is parents who volunteered to be part of the study who were supporting adults with intellectual disability. So we haven't, we haven't analyzed all of the data yet, but I'm gonna give you a snapshot of what we have found to date. And what we were looking for in this analysis was 
to try and understand the relevance of the framework to parents and their experience of using it in their day-to-day -day practice of providing support. So we asked the questions, what were their reflections on the training and the framework? But we didn't ask them directly what they thought about the training because they were part of a trial. Um, so what we've done is analyze the data to look at what they might have said about that and how they've reflected on, on their practice and using the framework um, just as part of the continuing interviews that we did them. So we didn't ask for, tell us what you thought about the training. Uh, we looked for how they changed their practice in the way they talked about providing support. And we asked the question, do they seem to have applied uh, the learning from the training to their support practice? And are they using the principles and the steps and the strategies in the framework more than they were doing um, originally? So we did uh, semi-structured interviews with family with parents about their approach to providing support uh, using a specific decision each time as Jacinta said and we interviewed them uh, before they did the training we interviewed them directly after they'd done the training then five months six months and 12 months we haven't got complete data for everybody but most people got to at least to the six month stage and then we did between one to five mentoring sessions and the mentoring sessions started um, after the training um, with, with the family, with the parents around their particular experience of providing support and they picked a, a particular issue that they wanted to talk about and, and the mentoring helped them work it through in terms of the framework. We use some of the same measures as the TAC study and, and what I can give you some preliminary findings on today were around the decision support questionnaire uh, and, and confidence of parents in making uh, decisions. So this is the participants. Um, as you can see, on the, all of the participants included paid workers, friends, siblings, um, other family members and parents. And the group that I'm talking about today is the group that were of parents who were trained. So there were 13 parents who supported somebody with an intellectual disability who also participated in, a, in an interview. And there were three parents who were supporting somebody with a more severe and profound intellectual disability. So I'm going to talk about them as a group, uh, which is 16 parents. And remembering that these were parents who had volunteered to be in a study. So they were already interested uh, in, in issues around support for decision-making. So again, I guess like the centers group, uh, you know, there are particular cross-section of parents uh, that are interested in these issues. So this is just a very bland finding in a sense, um, but the, the confidence of the supporters increased after the training. But if you look at this graph and you think about the one that Jacinta uh, put up before in relation to the support coordinators, this group of parents were quite confident in decision-making before they started. So pre-training, they their confidence level was 7.25. Um, and the TAC's confidence level was five. So these were a, quite a confident group of parents to start with, but nevertheless, there was some increase in their confidence after the training. Um, and I think that's an interesting thing to reflect on about the difference between parents and, and professionals in providing support, because often, parents have been doing it for a significant, most of their lives. Uh, so they're very experienced decision supporters. And this is, uh, you won't be able to make much sense of this, um, but this is the 33 item around the different uh, strategies that were used um, to support decision-making. So I'll just go on to the next slide. And I we too found some significant changes in the decision support strategies that parents used. They're not, not exactly the same changes that, that we saw with the support coordinators, but they're all changes that are in the right direction in terms of being coming more in line uh, with the, the strategies uh, for the framework um, and the strategies for effective decision support. So these parents, um, were, were more likely after the training to consult with other people who knew the person in different situations. And that reflects clearly the, the, the principle around orchestration. 
they were more likely to seek uh, advice from a professional expert, um, to rely on what the person wanted or preferred. They were actually less likely to make a decision on the spur of the moment and less likely to take the option that the person would least resist. And they were more likely to think about how they might be influencing the decision. And I've got, uh, I'll talk about that some more, the sort of they increased in their reflection on their influence. And they were more likely to help the person to act on and to proceed with the decision to be made. So there were some changes and they were changes in a positive direction. Um, and they were different changes from those that the professionals made, probably because they were starting from a different, a different starting point. Um, but most of what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna present is really the qualitative data um, from, from these parents. And I've identified three main themes from the qualitative data. And the first one is around that participating in the training acted as a, as a catalyst for parents to begin to reflect on the processes of the decision support. And so it's sort of captured by this phrase that one parent said, in fact, three parents said almost exactly the same phrase. It made me stop and think. It made me stop and think about what I was doing and how I was providing support for decision-making to my son or daughter. So they reflected on, on the support that they provided and they reflected on their own influence. Um, I'm not going to read out these quotes, but you can read them for yourselves. Um, but this first one from Gabby, she talks about becoming much, much more aware of, of, of how her own options of things were influencing and the need to step back and really think about what her son might want. Um, and the second one talks about, you know, it really helped her reflect more about how she impacted on, on the person that she was supporting. So just generating reflection on their own practice seemed to be one of the strongest things that came through um, in relation to the training for parents. And one parent said, uh, in particular, she said, I reflected that virtually everything uh, that Sally does has been decided by me. So she was deciding really that Sally would work and that would be her goal and that Sally would um, engage in a whole range of different activities. And she realized that both the decisions about the activities and the bigger goals in Sally's life had been uh, constructed by her uh, rather than being reflecting what Sally might, might want, have ambitions to do. So that reflection that parents had then came out in terms of their their sort of renewed, renewed commitment uh, to affirm uh, the rights of the person with a disability and to, to reaffirm that they wanted to support the person uh, to make decisions and participate in decisions rather than controlling them. So one of the parents said, I can see the need to relinquish control, to support her independence and for her to make more and more of her own decisions and to be less directive. And if you think about that in relation to what we know from the prior uh, research about uh, parents and decision making, this idea of being able to reflect on how powerful they are in the decision support process is a really fundamental first step to them providing good effective decision support. The other thing that they recognized and reflected on was how difficult it was for them uh, to provide support for decision making and why it was so difficult. So, and it was interesting, it was both two fathers that sort of reflected most on this. And one of them talked about uh, it taking a lot of energy to make sure that his daughter's preferences were always taken into account. Um, and it, how easy it was to be lazy and take the easy route. Um, and another father talked about it being really hard to be disciplined, um, to continue to pass over the responsibility for making decisions to his daughter. Um, and he says, you know, you have to keep disciplined. It's not a natural tendency. So it just goes to how hard this work is for parents. And I think it helps to understand the type of support that parents need uh, to, to continue with this, with support for decision-making practice. And interestingly, um, the other thing that they, they reflected on was the lack of uh, external reinforcement that they got for good support for decision-making practice. Um, 
Two of them in particular talked about uh, how the NDIS really didn't pay attention to this and wasn't reinforcing the need for them to be good supporters. And this is, this is a reflection from one of the parents about the NDIS, she says, and they don't really ask us whether the person we're supporting uh, to make decisions has been consulted. So they felt there was no reinforcement and no accountability. And therefore they weren't being pushed externally to change their practice and to reflect on their practice in the way that participating in the training had actually made them do. So the second sort of major theme that emerged was that parents talked about taking a more deliberate approach to providing support. And they talked about the value of having a structure, um, having something that, that they could follow. Uh, and this, I guess, was captured by one parent who said, probably when we talked about it initially, when we initially talked about support for decision-making, I just wasn't thinking as consciously about how I did it as I am now. So she'd shifted from it being something that she just did to something that she paid much more attention to in terms of how she did it and recognised the importance of the approach of her support. Um, and the training wheel uh, came up again and again through the data um, that parents felt that having this framework, having the picture of the wheel was very useful for them thinking about the steps that they needed to go through and giving them something to refer to, that it made it clearer for them what they were trying to do. And for one couple that was involved in the study, um, they felt that, that having the framework was also really important in terms of having a shared language between the two of them. So they could talk about how they provided support for decision-making. And you can see how that shared language might also be useful in communicating with uh, the other people involved in, in the support network. So in terms of being more deliberate, we saw evidence from parents around step three of the decision, um, decision steps, which they were starting to pay much more conscious attention to understanding people's preferences and what we call uh, active listening. So this parent talks about, it wasn't that we didn't listen before, but now we're really listening much more carefully we're trying to take on board what he's saying. We're trying to go deeper and deeper and peel off the layers and trying to discover what he's actually saying. And then they talk about how, how they do that. Um, and so she finishes this, this quote saying, well, I, I feel I'm in a better position. I'm more patient. I'm more able to listen more, to hear what he's actually saying and not what I think he's saying. So again, it's that stepping back, taking time and listening very carefully to the person's preferences around a decision. And a number of them actually discussed specific strategies that they had adopted for the first time. Um, so uh, this, this mother talked about how she had uh, set up a meeting with her daughter um, and her partner and that they'd got paper out and they'd got texters and they had a, a series of meetings actually with this method to try and put her, as she says, at the center of it to start to draw what some of her goals might be. Now that's, if you think about that, that sort of standard practice in person-centered planning. But these parents hadn't come across that, they hadn't done it before, and being part of the training had stimulated them to think about how can we actually uh, hear the person's voice much more clearly. Um, so that really worked and she talked about her daughter being really chuffed that she was now sort of at the centre of making goals and it was very different from before when she hadn't been involved in that goal setting at all. And she also felt that by doing this she began to have more confidence that her daughter did have a voice and that her daughter did have preferences and she began to pay more respect, more respect to those. Some parents talked about uh, paying attention to associated decisions. Um, this is, you know, you make a big decision and this uh, father talks about, well, um, you know, his daughter will come and show him a recipe in a magazine uh, that she wants to make. And often he would just sort of brush that inside and say, yeah, yeah, we'll do that tomorrow when we've gone shopping. 
But actually then he talked about having done the training, he was much more prone to think about, well, that's a decision she wants to make that recipe. But now there's lots of associated decisions with that. Like, well, who do you want to do it with? Where do you want to do it? When do you want to do it? And he talked about actually paying much more attention to those associated decisions, which then in turn helps the person make more decisions and have more control over their life. So as I mentioned before, um, and as the, the quantitative data showed, um, the parents spent uh, put much greater emphasis post the training on applying the principle of orchestration, on involving other people uh, in the support for decision-making process. And they did this in various ways. So some of them encouraged the person that they were supporting to begin to seek advice from others, um, to seek advice from other people that were maybe less involved than them as a parent or that knew the person from another perspective. Um, and sometimes they encourage the person to actually go and ask that person and to talk to them uh, uh, rather than to go and talk to the parent. So it's sort of broadening those people that were involved. And one, this is, this is a lovely example from a father of somebody who has severe and profound disabilities. So it was very difficult for this family to really understand what their daughter's preferences were um, outside of, of, of him and his wife. So he was sort of inspired in a sense by the training to start to ask other people. And in this case, he asked some of the other participants in his daughter's uh, day program, uh, what they thought his daughter, uh, what things she enjoyed. And he felt that by asking other participants, he got a very clear sort of unfiltered view um, of what his daughter preferred to do. And so he, he talked about that one of the participants had said that his daughter, um, Heather, she loved the bus. She really loved going on the bus to the beach, but she hated the beach. And that's a really key piece of information um, that then he can use in terms of, of, of framing and supporting her in terms of future decisions. So she likes going on bus rides, but clearly she doesn't like the beach. So maybe thinking about bus rides to somewhere else. But it was a technique that he hadn't used uh, before. And, and you could see he was starting to use this in a whole range of different contexts for his daughter. And the other thing that happened was that um, a number of supporters talked about uh, having bigger expectations now of other people that were involved in the person's life. Uh, so this mother talked about, she employed uh, through the NDIS, uh, a bunch of support workers who worked with her son. And she talked about now, well, we expect them to be having conversations with her son about promoting his choice and promoting his involvement in decision-making. So she was now, telling the support workers and being much more clearly what she expected of them around her son making decisions. And what we saw too was parents talking about um, identifying decisions and creating many more opportunities for their son or daughter to make decisions. So one of them said, well, I, I think I'm making a conscious plan now on my part to give her those options, not just to pull the bread out of the freezer and make a sandwich, because it's important that Sally gets involved in decision-making and has that practice. So they were deliberately creating more opportunities and those opportunities then create more experience and then they create more confidence in the person themselves. And what was really clear then is that as the person, as the supporters changed their practice, the person changed their level of confidence. And that meant that the parents had to start to adjust their knowledge about the person. So it's a, a sort of virtuous circle that we saw beginning to happen. So in terms of the framework, um, all of these parents really had a very deep knowledge of the person that they were supporting. Um, they, they talked about how well they knew the person and that they were probably the person who knew that person best. Um, and, but they also talked about how they'd adjusted their knowledge as their son or daughter had matured. Um, and then they talked about how they were readjusting their knowledge as the person's confidence increased and their own support changed. And, and I guess this is a, a lovely sort of example that, that helps 
to uh, anchor what the sort of research that we do back in the reality of people's lives. So this mother talked about her son saying, he's making more and more decisions himself, like the smaller ones. He's taking ownership of them a little bit more. And she says, he's a different person. There's a smile on his face. He's more upright and he's like, I'm choosing this, I'm making it happen. It's not somebody else, somebody else leading me. So this, the, the change in the supporters approach was having an incredibly positive of, uh, effect on her son. And I think that's the, the reason that support for decision-making is so important. So just to summarize before we do some overarching conclusions that Jacinta's <gasps> gonna to talk to, um, the, this framework is clearly relevant to parent decision supporters. Um, and there's evidence in the data of many of its components being embedded in their decision support practice after the training and after the mentoring. Um, there's somebody outside my window making signs at me. This is the joys of presenting from home. I think he's gone away, so that's all right. Um, <laughs> so training in the framework generated uh, self-reflection and it, it provided for families uh, a means of self-assessment about their decision support practice. It provided structure and guidance for their practice. It prompted the more deliberate use of the steps and the principles associated with effective decision support. And it prompted change practice by parents that increased the confidence of the people they were supporting. It provided some insights into the complexities and the demanding nature of decision support. And what was clear too is that we can't assume that all parents are familiar with the concepts in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Some of the fa families hadn't come across uh, that sort of high, that pedigree of where support for decision making had come from. But it also highlighted um, that if we're going to have support for decision making schemes, uh, then they need to be really well implemented with supporters and that supporters um, are going to require uh, training and we need to build their capacity and that's going to require investment in training and opportunities for problem solving through mentoring, uh, peer support and things like communities of practice. But parents are key decision makers uh, who have to be involved in training. I'm going to hand over at this point to Jacinta who's going to talk to the last slide. Um, while I sort out my dog who thinks it's time to go for a walk. Um, over to you, Jacinta. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, so in, in terms of conclusions, um, one of the things that we were really excited about, because you know, when you start doing a research project, you never know what you're going to find and lots of people do find um, negative results. And what we're really chuffed about ourselves is that we've demonstrated the value of the framework and training in shifting practice of supporters in two different contexts. So from the context of parents who have been involved in the process of support for decision making for a very long time, and in a professional context of, of coordinators who are coming in to work with somebody who they don't know anything about. So two kind of extremes of how much involvement these people have had. Um, there's this evaluative focus that comes with our support for decision-making framework um, shows this shift toward greater participation of the person and effective support strategies. It's, the exciting thing that we have with the ARC data is we can also have a look at what's happening from the perspective of the person who's being supported and we're in the process of doing that. We know now that very much support for decision, if I could talk, support for decision making is a process. It's not just an outcome. It's an ongoing process. It's a process that grows, that has ups and downs sometimes, but that it's a process. It's not just a one-off thing that we can actually identify and take a pill and change. Um, what the question, the, the issue here is what about the people supported for whom self-report is difficult? 
we need to actually, and, and we are going to um, do some in-depth case studies and observations so we can see whether or not there is, we can see the change that's happening in the person's lives. Clearly, the supporters are talking about some of these changes. You can see the smile on his face, he's standing more tall, all of those sorts of issues. But we need to actually get in there and be able to observe those types of situations and to be able to record what are the behaviours that do change? What are the behaviours that signify a change in well-being for that person because they're now participating in decision making about their own life? Um, we've already said, both of us have said how important it is to make sure training and mentoring take account of the different roles and the context of supporters. Um, and that's, that's really clear and a really important aspect to how you deliver the training or how you deliver the framework. Um, trainers need to be familiar with the unique characteristics of people being supported. So you need to come with that expert knowledge base, if you like, and supporter style and confidence may be important factors to understand. And we saw that in, in many, in both cases, actually, in both parts of this research, that we, we are still to look at the, at the supporter style in our, in our parents, um, but I think we'll see a very similar situation. Um, our framework, it took it away, Chris. Thank you, nearly done. <laughs> um, the framework does provide, and the, the coordinators were very clear about this, and I think so were the um, parent supporters in, in the second aspect of the, of the training, was that it gives you a tool for external accountability of, of support practice. You can actually show how you come to support a decision with a, with a person. And that's really important in the sense of both professional environments, but it's also important for, for parents to be able to show, yes, I'm considering this person's will and preference. This is not just my preference. Um, we've shown that it's, it's being embedded in the TAC practice. It's now embedded in that practice. And that's really exciting from the point of view of being able to hopefully start a bit of a... A, a continuous trail of change in how we see support for decision making in the professional context and hopefully it'll roll out to the professionals that those coordinators have contact with across the whole range of their practice. And we've got a lot more analysis of paid supporters to do in the ASC project. Thank you all for your wonderful attention.